This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. Welcome back to the ZMAR Podcast, where we have a guest in studio, Dave Wills. He's a Southside native, and uh, I appreciate his time coming by the studio and recording with me today. How are you doing, Dave? Good. Thanks for having me, Butch. Excited to uh, talk some payroll and HR. Can you give our audience a little bit of background on who you are, where you come from, besides this all-star basketball player? <laughs> yeah, so uh, born and raised on the south side of Chicago, uh, but a Cub fan, which is very, very rare. Don't hold that against me, but kind of took an interesting path from to get into the payroll and HR world. I was a high school teacher and basketball coach for a number of years, and then uh, left the basketball and teaching game and started in the HCM world. I've been doing that for roughly 11 years and uh, different types of companies, different types of knowledge, but uh, still born and raised in the South Side and still keep my family here. Yeah. And you still play basketball. Yes. Poorly. Uh, I, I don't know if I could have got worse than I was in high school, but I somehow have. Hey, you're still hacking at it, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's all that matters. So now um, with your experience you know, from the payroll business and moving into PEO structured now, uh, like what have you seen businesses going through in the, in the last, you know, so many years that you've been doing, especially I, I think drastically in the last five years, right? Uh, especially with COVID really changed some things. So what have you seen some trends and what, what have you seen problems with in the workplace? It's kind of crazy. In, in 10 years, the landscape has changed from just doing one operation, being your payroll, and then maybe outsourcing the HR, the time and attendance to companies starting to consolidate everything. Uh, the PEO world has been around since 1986, but they were still piecemeal and different things, uh, outsourcing the time and attendance to different firms. But every firm kind of wants that unified solution. So uh, you look at what the iPhone and the Android has done to not only people putting your camera, you know, photography, uh, video recorder, anything you want into one box. Everyone's kind of looking for that one stop shop. So everything that Companies are now acquiring and building their own, which they're investing in. The payroll world is is no different. They've uh, they've really adapted to kind of meeting the customer where they're at, which is interesting. But the biggest change, I think, is in the human resources. Uh, people used to have a negative connotation around HR and human resources. If you go into a company with five people or 500, if you ask everyone what is human resources, you'll get five or 500 different answers. And uh, the most common one, unfortunately, is where you go to get fired. And uh, so obviously that's a negative connotation, but uh, I think companies have now kind of switched from a reactive HR to a proactive. And I think that's the biggest change is that companies are now investing in the human resources development to keep employees engaged, you know, kind of keep that employees also retained. And I think that's the biggest change that we've seen in the last 10, but definitely the last five and uh, definitely from COVID with the, with the markets going crazy. Sure. Now, obviously, and we'll get in the details of what a PEO really is, but, you know, obviously, in a nutshell, it puts a bunch of products or, or services together in one, one little bucket. But uh, I guess, how does that differ than um, having it broken apart? Because one advantage of being broken apart is there's more competition. You could shop things. All right. And, and then and then putting it all together, obviously, there's got to be a reason. Right. No, that um, there's so much competition and you know, from the ADPs to, you know, the Paylosities to the Insperities to, you know, the BBSIs of the world, each product is kind of different in each way. Now, breaking it apart, you can get best in class in payroll, best in class in benefits, best in class in workers' comp. Uh, you could also, you know, bundle that together. And the best analogy I typically give when someone doesn't know what a PEO is or what a PEO does is we use our economy of scale like the Costco model doing your payroll kind of gets you the membership, and then you get discounts on your workers comp, your benefits. And the biggest thing is we become your back office for HR compliance. Cause unfortunately all the new HR laws and labor laws are targeted at small to medium sized business. So I think each has its benefits. Obviously, you know, companies wouldn't stay profitable if you couldn't break it away and, and bundle it together. I think depending on your scale, you're an iPhone guy or you're an Android. If you want it broken apart, or if you want to bundle together, but I, I really don't think you can go wrong as long as you're outsourcing because I really think there's a ton of compliance and a ton of risk when you're you know filing your taxes on your own and things like that. Sure, sure, and, and it sounds like that's the the biggest reason why that PEO existed, right, and why it started. And uh, obviously, 
Uh, I always say, you know, like I always state that it's started in the 80s, and I think you said 86. Yep. Uh, yeah, and so, and that's where all the lawsuits occurred. The they paved the way, um, and they're still around today. They just changed names, but um, but obviously the competition has been uh, growing, right? And there's people starting PEOs out of their own house, and then they grow from there. And um, it's entrepreneurial in, in a lot of ways, but there's obviously a lot of compliance um, that comes along with it. And so can, can you give a little bit more background, like the reasons that employers would be looking for the PEO structure because, and, and we'll get to like a lot of times I get the phone call, they're like, hey, we should go to a PEO because we can get a discount on our health insurance. And which yeah. it, it could be true, but it doesn't. It depends. Yeah. It, it very, it very yeah. much depends. Yeah. Every client's yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So give us some background on why, what would be a good reason that some, a candidate that would look at a PEO? I'd say probably over 85% of companies that join a PEO join it for one reason, is nobody starts a business to worry about payroll, tax, compliance, and human resources. Most entrepreneurs or, or startups you know, have a great idea. The first person they hire is typically a friend or a confidant that they know. And then they realize, you know, shoot, I got to kind of scale this thing because I'm getting more clients than I'm used to. And then when you kind of outsource your first hire, whether it's LinkedIn, Indeed, you know, Zip Recruiter, whatever you, you know, you find when you kind of grow outside your network is when you open yourself up for compliance issues. So you hire someone in Wisconsin, not knowing about the reciprocity tax laws, you hire, you know, someone in a different town or someone you don't know that now, you know, you might have to watch what you say or how you develop that person. Uh, you hire more than five people. You now in Illinois, you're going to have to provide a 401k. So what do I do to that? What who, do I bring in a partner? Do I talk to somebody that that knows this. So where PEO really started is when the litigation started for, you know, EEOC laws, payroll laws, small and medium-sized business really got hit, like you said, in the 80s. And people were starting business and saying, wait, I can hire someone for maybe $20,000 instead of hiring an HR person for $100,000 in Chicago or, you know, a, a controller that I don't, you know, know what the cost is or maybe outsourcing that to my accountant. So they wanted to control their business, but not having to work on their business every day. I think that's the main type of client that, that PEO service. And then, you know, as they grow and scale, sometimes the success factor moves them out of a PEO when they grow, when they can have that buying power, uh, you know, with benefits and then kind of hiring their own staff and they're growing to, to some different things. So most PEOs have a great retention model, but most when they lose it is it's a success factor because the PEOs allow you to scale and grow and that's something that private equity takes a look at too. And when your books are kind of bundled up and you know, there's no skeletons in the closet type thing, you know, and not to be negative to what you said, I always say PEOs are like square peg round hole, right? Because when it comes to businesses, it's not like this end all be all where like, let's just go to PEO so we can solve all these problems. There's a, there's a, a big, huge checklist. And there's a lot of times we've got personally in our office, we've gotten quotes and then we go through the whole entire process and we find out that it's not a good fit. Sure. And, and and so, like, I don't know if you know percentages of, of like, uh, somebody comes to you, like, what's the percentage of success of it's a good fit? So that that's a great question. Sometimes they're not a fit for us. We might not be a fit for them, which is very common, but if they have a large work comp claim or, uh, you know, maybe some big medical claims, that, that would basically poison our pool. So the PEO market, by putting all our clients in, you know, one big pot and then using that economy of scale I mentioned earlier might not fit for everyone. So the PEO market itself is about 17% of payroll of the payroll industry, which is, you know, seems small, but it's actually massive. If you think about all the competitors we have out there, the ADP total sources, you know, the Oasis and Sparities. It's tons. Uh, trying tons. To, and, yeah. and like you said, some just, you know, grow in the backyard and, and, yeah. and kind of white label and I solved and, and, and take it from there. But I, I honestly think that it's not for everyone for a reason, just like, uh, you know, there's GMC and there's Toyota. So it depends on what you're looking for for your business. But I think the biggest thing against PEOs is the miseducation. Some people see them as a threat. Some people see it as, you know, like you said, square peg round hole, which is actually a very common phrase in the PEO industry. Um, what I think PEOs have done to combat that recently is they're kind of meeting the client where they're at and uh, kind of changing that to fit, not giving you a whole such, you know, solution, kind of letting you check the box and pick, which some of the, you know, ASO payroll providers have, have done in the yeah. past. Well, you definitely bring up a good point. There, it's probably a good 10 years ago. I was um, working side by side with another PEO. We were kind of 
I, I sent them some business. They sent me business that didn't fit for them. It was a good working relationship. And I, it, at that point, I started to notice more PEOs popping up in the marketplace. And I asked them the question. I was like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Because obviously they're big, they're nationwide, they publicly trade in. And uh, his response is, uh, was, it's good. We need more of employers to understand who we are. Yes. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, PEO was big and, and obviously companies were making a ton of money. But I think the advent of ACA and some new laws, uh, different states too, like like New York, for, for example, if you're under 50, you have to be on their state health plan, similar to, uh, you know, some other regional laws. But PEO is huge there because the rates might be better and they don't necessarily mind what the cost of the PEO is, but the health savings can kind of offset that. So I think just like any, you know, typical situation, things that start in California and New York kind of migrate to the Midwest. And uh, I think most CEOs, CFOs, you know, chief human resource, resource officers, even owners are getting more educated on the PEO business because unfortunately the main thing is the cost of healthcare just continues to skyrocket. And People are always looking for, you know, if you save 10% here, where can I reinvest that back in my business? And I think that's the reason the PEO uh, landscape continues to scale and grow is because healthcare continues to scale upward. And that's one of the main reasons people come to a PEO. But if they actually looked at the reason they stay, it's usually the HR, the compliance. I think healthcare might get you in the door, but again, that's not for everyone too, depending on where your health plan is and what your group is. So it, it's it's a little bit of a give and take, but I, I kind of agree with you to a certain uh, certain degree that it's not for everyone for a reason, given our terms and and the client's terms. And I think that's what makes it great is the more competition we have, the more we have to adapt. We have to meet the customer more where they're at instead of just saying, hey, we're just like them, but $10 cheaper or we're just like X and, and Y. I think uh, adaptability is, you know, quote, money balls or, you know, adapt or die. Yeah, for sure. So that's, that's kind of, I think, the, the model we're going towards. I know some employers could be afraid because they feel like they're giving up an element of control, yes. right? And, and and in some ways they are, but it's a trade-off, right? Um, it's a compromise, in, in, like in marriage, right, to get from point A to point B. Um, you have to figure things out. And, you know, I, and when I paint a picture for the PEO, it's like, okay, what, what's your end game, right? And how fast do you want to get there, right? And because it may not be a good fit now, um, and and the reason I bring that up is because you keep the phrase you keep using is we're going to meet you where you're at, right? Yep. And so one thing I've noticed over the years with PEOs is that um, that um, they become more customized or flexible in how they make the offering. And w- what I mean by that is they broke up some of the channels, right? And so let's say right now you're not a good fit for certain product lines, right? Sure. But the biggest and and less underwriting is the HR payroll, right? And so it's like, well, let's build some structure for you because I tell you, we have tons of 20, 30, 40, 50 employee clients that have no structure. And so uh, can you talk about that where where maybe sometimes it's not a good fit for the full PEO, but then the flexibility that it's offered? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like preference. Uh, do you want navigation on your car? Or do you just want it to get you to a to, a to B and you know where you're going? I think the adaptability of the payroll systems now uh, allow customers to break away. And then with these new API hooks and, and, you know, back office solutions like ease employee navigator that I'm sure you use all the time uh, allows you to maybe the PEO's master plan is with United Healthcare and United Healthcare doesn't really fit your client because they they want certain X from Blue Cross Blue Shield. We can establish the payroll and HR foundation and then bring in someone like yourself or another broker to carve out the benefits. So they might not get the benefit discount they're looking for. And I'm making air quotes that you can't see, but they're still getting that HR compliance foundation. So they're not worried about maybe 75% of the back office nuances and still have a best in class benefit that they that they deem best in class. Where back in the day, you had to take their workers' comp, you had to take their their health, everything, and then you were kind of maybe you were using a learning management system, and you had an auto body shop that there was nothing to do. So you were paying X, and people were looking at the cost and saying, "Well, maybe this doesn't fit my business." Even though I thought it did, you know, when I had ten employees, now that I'm at twenty five, I, I got to take a look at this. So the scalability and using of service agreements versus contracts has also been a big deal because people are taking a look at it every 30 days and, and saying, okay, 
my labor cost is X. How do I get down to Y? And, and, and they look things like that. But the customization has been huge because that's what people want. They want to be able to change their backgrounds. They want to be able to put their you know logos on things. And most PEOs just said, no, this is what you're getting. It's a box solution, square peg, round hole. Yep. But that's changed in the last five years, especially because the customer is becoming more educated and the owners are demanding more. And to be honest, the biggest reason though is the millennial workforce coming in is demanding so much from just compliance issues to, you know, wanting something on their phone, wanting an app, things like that, that it's forcing these, these owners and, and business owners, especially to adapt if you want that great talent. So they're trying to say, Hey, I need this, this, and this, I need it to look pretty. Uh, but I also need X, Y, and Z, you know, for, for my new workforce coming in. So I think we'll see PEOs get even more technical in the next couple of years because of, you know, the, not only the advanced in technology, but the workforce as well. If you own a business, Elite Benefits of America wants to remind you that health insurance open enrollments are either happening now or coming very quickly. And this is the time to review and implement a health care plan to make or keep you as the employer of choice. Deadlines for open enrollment range between November 1st and January 1st. Get ahead of the curve. The Small Business Special Enrollment Period, part of the Affordable Care Act, now allows employers with 49 employees and under to offer health benefits without contributing a dime to the employee plan. Help your employees save money on taxes with health insurance they're already paying for with their hard-earned dollars. Butch Zemar from Elite Benefits of America wants you to reach out to him today. Visit EliteBenefits.net or call 708-535-3006. Now, one thing we, we've we noticed, especially on our side, but you could probably comment on this too, where where even though a business is, you know, whether they're stagnant or not, or their growth, um, there's a lot of things that go into the business that don't make them money, but they have to work on. Otherwise, if they don't do it, they're going to have disgruntled employees. Uh, they're, they're, they may have legal issues. And so if anything, at the end of the day, like um, the build at HR to have more structure, because how many employees leave a workplace because there's no structure? Um, more and more by the day. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And building a, a financial or not a financial, but, a, but just a structure, the HR structure internally, you can maintain some of that because now a millennial can come in or any employee and it feels, looks and feels like a bigger company, right? Yeah. Uh, and it just makes them feel a little bit cozy. And now- moving forward a little bit now they move into the um, i think you're calling it a service agreement right yes. and so a service agreement is just more of the hr function payroll and then now you get to a certain point you're growing you're adding employees now as an alternative to um the health plan because one of the things that a lot of brokers do including myself instead of just adjusting deductibles so you could stay with the same carrier we're sure. actually trying to explore other options what what, what can we feasibly do um, to control costs, provide access to care without jeopardizing the employees. So now we get to the level of, okay, now we look at, because I would assume the more premium base, the more financially that you'll look at it. And, sure. and, and so how do you see some, some of the conversion going from the service agreement moving into benefits? So it, it's a lot of people want the foundation first. And it depends on how big they are when they come to us. I mean, we have clients that are three employees. We have clients that are, you know, 3,000, 5,000 employees. Uh, it depends on where they are, what they're used to. I'd say about 40% of our clients, once they join a PEO, are not offering benefits at the time. And then they see, hey, I have this quote from a broker like yourself, or I have this, make it make sense to me. Because like most insurance, it's the largest expense you hope you never use. The PEO kind of shows it as a bundled solution when we kind of present it. So we can get them up and running on the payroll and HR in a matter of days, weeks, depending on the size. But the benefits takes a little time to massage, like, you know, yeah. uh, you know, let's talk about contribution rates. Let's talk, you know, X, Y. Everyone wants to offer health benefits until they find out what it costs. Not only the employer, but the employee is surprised that it costs them money, too. I was w with a potential client the other day and. They basically reached out to us saying, hey, we're really excited to offer health. You know, you guys offer health benefits now. We're excited to add that to our feature. So I went out there and quoted them. They're like, we thought this was included. I'm like, uh, unfortunately, it's not. It's a huge it's a huge number that I would love to include, but uh, your rates are going to go up significantly. So I think the education on the health from 
zero to X is always, you know, sticker shock. And I think uh, once you get the payroll in the HR and they understand that, you kind of see like, are there other options? Can we do a stipend? Can we do an HRA? Can we do, you know, the open marketplace until this? But typically, again, like I just mentioned, it's the employees driving that. Like the owner typically will have health care through their significant other. Uh, so they're usually fine. But it's the when the employee, they hire someone good and say, hey, I, I have a family or I just turned 26. I'm off my parents' plan. What can you do for me? And I think that is like, okay, I might lose, you know, X, Y or J- John Joe. John Doe, Jane Doe, because, you know, we can't offer them health or it might not work. So I think that's usually the the starting point where the, the scale gets tipped and then they start looking at options. They reach out to me or reach sure. out to you. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Has the scale ever tipped the other way? You get a client with benefits and then the claims go too much and then you have to give the bad news. So I, I don't want to say no, because I'd be, I'd be lying to you. Uh, but it's not really yes either. Uh, when that happens, I typically bring it if, if we if they get a monster renewal, which is very rare because our pond is an ocean, not a pond. Right. You know, so if one ripple doesn't necessarily shake sure. the boat that much, but I mean there are claims all the time. No, even even an ocean, you know, can produce a tsunami. So uh, I typically will bring somebody in and offer a competitive quote and say, Hey, I want you as a client and I'll keep you at the HR. Like yeah. maybe we do move you and you might get a a sweetheart rate or, or uh, someone looking to buy the business and which is rare in the, in the PEO world. Most people want everything bundled. I, I want the client for life. And that's, that's kind of my pitch is I will do anything to make sure they stay solvent and they stay above board. So I'll, I'll bring in competitive quotes a lot just to show them what's out there because it's like anything else. Everyone shops on the internet now, including sure. payroll, HR yeah, benefits, yeah, you name yeah. it. But I, I trust some people and I, I, I always refer people out and say, T- take a look at this. And, and you have to, you're educating the client was when you truly become a consultant. So sure. there are some clients that got whacked with, with big renewals. And in the past, maybe six to 7% have taken that outside sure. counsel. Cause unfortunately we're not, we're not raising them for any, you know, for no reason. Sure. There is some, uh, some skeleton in the closet or, or unfortunate claims is probably a better word than skeleton in the closet. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it depends on what's going on. And sometimes it, a changing carrier can kind of shake some things up in a good way for the client. So that, that's Absolutely. not a bad thing. No, it's definitely a great response. Uh, I know I put you on the spot there, but not, not every PEO has their issues. And, I, and, and we've gained business because the PEO says, hey, you know, we're at a certain point. And that's why you partner with people such as myself and yep. others where, yeah. where there's opportunities that come in the door where you're just providing the solution. And, and the same goes with... Um, all, all every service that's offered inside of the workplace, and sure. and I think that's great because then you're always we're always trying to provide solutions and move them forward, right? Not backwards, right? And so I think that's key, especially when businesses are trying to grow. Now, speaking of growth and and things going forward, what do you see moving in in this space going forward? Right? You talked a little bit about technology. Is there anything else that you guys are seeing on the forefront that in the coming years that you might be seeing in the workplace? Yeah, uh, technology is the big one. Just kind of moving forward with app development, user interface is huge. Uh, you know, I, but I think the main thing will be connecting the C-suite with your employees. Now that can be uh, done in numerous ways, videos that you get sent out. Uh, you know, people used to watch shows for 30 minutes. Now, if you look at one of my soon to be four kids, they watch Bluey for seven minutes and TikToks for 30 seconds. Everybody wants their information so quick and so dynamically. I think getting that out quick 30 second, you know, video or a 30 second text message, something right away compared to a 25 bullet point email that you might read. Uh, and I think making trainings, those quick hitter videos too. Right now, if you sit down in a training for a new company, sometimes it can be 50 minutes and is your employee engaged for 50 minutes in a training? I don't know, but you can, you can catch them in five minute breaks, Sure, you know, and, yeah. and, and kind of space it out. But the trend, major trend, other than technology, will be proactive versus reactive. And I think that's similar to insurance. Yeah. Being proactive is covering your butt instead of reactive when the situation already happened. Okay, there's a hole in my house and it's leaking. That's a reactive situation. Got to patch it up. What if we went up there and said, hey, there's a pretty soft spot here in your HR. Let's sure that up. Now, you might pay a little more up front for the, re- uh, for the proactive, yeah. but you're saving 
probably 10x on sure. the reactive. Right. And I think the advent of, you know, society human resource management and, and things like that, how they've grown exponentially since COVID shows that there's a ton of issues people don't know about. There's a ton of things going on behind the scenes. And there's a lot of things that you just can't even ask people now that you would think is a common question. Like, uh, you know, where we're recording this is Brother Ice grad. I, I went to Brother Ice. So I, I can't ask him if I was interviewing him what year he graduated. Now, oh. that might, that's a very common question on the South Side. Sure. But I just also figured out his age, which if I don't hire him could be an age discrimination lawsuit. So things that like you just you know kind of yeah, going sure. back and forth even af- even yeah. after the interview's over when you're saying oh you went to Rice you know tell when, who is you know yeah is Coach Dwyer still there is Coach Richardson still there things like that uh, you can get a sense of their age and that's opens you up especially if you don't hire that person now I'm not saying I'm not going to hire someone that went to Brother Rice that I would love to but there's so many things that you just deem in normal conversation that are big no nos in the HR world so I think that proactive reactive training your staff that's going to be you know, through videos, things like that is going to really continue. It's, it's already getting big now, but it's continued to grow and, and probably become necessary for all mm-hmm. companies. Yeah. And you're 100% right because we're seeing it, right? We're right. seeing uh, some issues uh, arise because of one simple question that nobody else in the world would ever thought of, but it, it, it reverts back to you could figure out the age, even though the question that was asked had nothing to do with age. Um, just like, uh, you know, what year did you graduate, but yeah. it, it, your intent is like, Oh, how close was it to mine? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Or, or, Hey, do you know this guy? Because he yeah, was you there. Play the name game. Then. Yeah. So right. Name game. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it just doesn't worry. So, so with these trends, let's say so, uh, we have a company there, there's a fit. However, even if we start with a service agreement, then we move to the full PEO and they finally get to that point where what, what does it look like when an employee employer, rather an employer finally outgrows the PEO? So it's a conversation. So, where, where I'm at currently, we do blueprints and, and like to do quarterly meetings. So sure. we're constantly involved in the business because, like I said, we're your back office. So we're educating the client. The client's educating on us. And, hey, we're looking to buy a new building. We're looking to grow. And the first thing we ask is, have you looked at, you know, changing providers or once you grow to get here? And, and we've built such a relationship that they're pretty honest. And we want them to be, you know, hey, yeah, we're, we're actively looking. I said, well okay, let me help you. Like here, here's some things that you're going to lose. Uh, one of my clients currently spun off from a 700 person group and they kind of didn't know what they had until it was gone. So they reach out, they're trying to get health benefits and the open market and they're under 50. So they're ACA, you know, banded and they're like, man, this is a 28% increase from our current. Sure. And I'm surprised it's only 28. Yeah. And, and the employees were feeling it. Yeah. You know, um, uh, they're like, what are we going to do here? Do we go on Cobra? So they reached out to a few PEOs and uh, they also came to me and we were able to, with their renewal, get them 3% under, which typically it's more than that. But at the same time, we were, you know, not 28, we were 31% if you look at it that way. Sure. Right. And, uh, but the main thing we provide, that was great. That kind of kept us in the game, but their payroll person is not HR certified, had no idea. They're looking to expand to another state. They had no idea what's going on. Illinois and Indiana are very close with the with the time change, but it's still Indiana laws, Indiana tax laws. Uh, so we were able to empower her to kind of get her back focused in the business, and we're taking care of all the unnecessary BS on the back end. Uh, so that was the big difference. And what happened there is the benefits were necessarily the agreement, but what won us the deal was the payroll and compliance. So other, other you know, PEOs were a little bit higher than us medically. Uh, one was significantly lower. And they, you know, had a service team and things like that that was a 1-800 number. They didn't want to deal with that. They had a pretty negative experience. So uh, that's what kind of won us the deal was, even though we were a little higher, according to them, uh, the service model and what we were able to provide and the longevity for you know, we call it a client for life, which is great until they succeed. And I'm not saying they're not currently succeeding. I'm saying where they outgrow or like anything else, you outgrow a manufacturing building. That's a great thing. You know, Amazon started in the garage. I don't know. You know they're pretty high up now. So uh, the the growth is something we want for our clients because actually they're, they're our best referral partners. Clients that get, you know, start in a garage or three, four people and grow to 40, 
80, 100. The, you know, they meet small business owners all the time. They say, hey, start with, you know, BBSI and see, see how we can grow and, you know, I'll give you some contacts. But I think the payroll and HR foundation is, is so critical now with, uh, I gave a talk the other day. There's 287 payroll roles in Illinois that were started in 2023. I don't know them all. I know about eight, and uh, I don't know how anyone could know them all. So that's 281 that I don't know. But I know anytime a law rolls out, our corporate office trains them, and in, in, whether it's fixing a handbook, letting the employer know. But all these are targeted small, medium-sized business, which you'd think they'd rather go after you know the whales, the Amazons, the you know the, the big companies of the world. But they know they're all litigated up and same thing like a, a speeding ticket. They're going to, you know, try and go after the blue collar people and, and uh, the smaller, smaller fish because it's, it's easy money for them. But it, it's just a shame that people don't start companies to deal with this. And I think that's a huge advantage of the PEO and why we're still in business. Yeah, for sure. And you bring up a good point. You know, the bigger companies, they could adapt a lot faster when the Affordable Care Act came into play and there was regulations. Yep. They were the first ones to say, okay, like, like uh, some of it was the same and that they were already doing and some of it they had to change, such as reporting or whatever. It's very easy for them to transition and they have the capital to just say, you know what, can you just make this go away? Here's some money right. and just take care of it just so we're done. And then you get to the smaller employer, they just can't do that. Kind of like, uh, I don't know if it's a federal or state law, the one that you have to disclose the salary information now when you're hiring, yes. you when you're 15 employees. Is that state or federal? Uh, that's state at the oh, moment. Oh, yeah. So yes. we're talking about difference between Illinois and Indiana, right? Sure. And so, like, if you're bouncing back and forth uh, and you miss that boat, right, and uh, there is a compliance thing, I hope they fight that one. But I think that's a little bit um, overreach, but uh, there's a lot of technicalities to that. Yeah, it, it's it's good and bad, right? You're seeing trans, transparency. With any with any time there's litigation, it's not always bad. And I And sometimes when I say that, people give me a really dirty look. But sometimes change is good. But knowing here, here's why I think it's good. Okay, you're looking for a new job. You know, you're looking to do an addition on your house. Having you know, have a baby, get married. You, you might need a you know a pay bump. You think you've outgrown your company, which happens. You want to know that. All right, the base salary is you know eighty five thousand. Right now, you're making sixty five thousand. That that's great. I can maybe you know get that minivan or you know finance something else. That's awesome. That you know exactly what you're going into. However. What about the employee that does the same job for you that's hired for sixty at sixty five thousand three years ago, and maybe gotten, you know, let's call it five thousand conservatively in raises. So you're coming in with zero experience from working at a company. The guy might have five years experience, and you're making fifteen thousand dollars more than him. And that employee can see the same thing, and then can do the jump ship. And then you know, it's just the. Uh, I think if you have to place some of that, those. Uh, salaries that you you better true everybody up because people talk, especially in happy hour situations and company parties. And I know you're not supposed to talk about money, religion, politics, but everyone does. And if uh, if you're ever bored with it, just go on Twitter and you can find enough arguments on religion, politics, and money at all times. So uh, for sure, uh, yeah. The same thing happens with employee contributions, right? Absolutely. Yeah, people, uh, employers are like, "Well, I like Johnny over there better, so I'm going to pay his health insurance a little bit yeah. more." Uh, because, you know, it's going to happen, right? They're going to go out to lunch and something will slip. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, why are you paying 100% for his and not mine? Yeah, right. And it creates a problem. And and most employees are uneducated on health care. I mean, you, you see it going through renewals all the time. So do I. I've rarely seen, and you might, a health care decrease from year to year. I've seen a very small increase of 1% that you don't really notice. I've seen 35%, 40%. But the employee doesn't always feel that increase. That's the business owner eating 40%. And let's say he said, hey, I can't afford this. We have clients said that to us. Hey, I got a 40% increase. I can't afford that. I don't want, I love my employees. I don't want my employees to feel the brunt of this either. Well, that's great. They might come to us and say, what can you do? And that's a situation where they might be able to save them some money and kind of keep the employee static or the employee whole. But imagine if, and I think this might be coming, I, this is a might be a little bit out there, but that the employee gets an increase every time instead of the employer. And that's, that's going to be, you know, anarchy in the streets. So I hope it doesn't happen. But if the employee knew some of the medical rates and increases that the employer got, it'd be, uh, that's why I always tell my clients, share it with your employees. So they know, especially if you're yes. eating the cost and, uh, and, and, and some are not going to value it, but right. other ones are like, really, you're going to eat that? Like, thank you. Like, 
So we provide total compensation reports, and those are those are eye opening. Even even for myself, you think if your you know your salary fifty thousand dollars, you cost the company fifty thousand dollars? No, you don't. They pay your employer taxes. You know, is X. They pay your health insurance. Let's just say it's a thousand dollars. They pay fifty percent the minimum. That's another five hundred bucks a month. So that's you know six grand, and sure. you kind of keep going. And then you realize that you're costing the company about eighty thousand. When you right. think, oh, they can afford to pay me eighty, well, they pay eighty, and then they're pay. Actually, it's costing one hundred and ten, one hundred twenty five. So, I I always tell employers when I work with them, I go, have you accessed our total compensation report? Sometimes they don't even know what the employees costing them because you know, it, especially in small, medium sized business, uh, your employees are basically your family members, but they're also your highest expense after payroll. Right? Family's great, but it. it like like any family you mentioned, you know, wife, kids, yeah. they're also expensive. Yes. So, yes. Uh, it's it's just interesting how that dynamic has really been pushed to the forefront with, you know, just the advancement of technology and just the advancement of society too. I mean, these are these are topics that were not talk, talked about when my parents were were were, were running a business or doing sure. anything. You know, and now yeah. it's different. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and just to wrap up real quick, speaking of family, uh, congratulations. I think, what, next week she's due? Two weeks from today. Yeah, two weeks from today. Yeah. So congrats May on 25th. that. 25th, yeah. And then uh, if one of um, someone in our audience that wants to uh, you know, look into PEO or look at those alternative options, obviously they could call us. But yeah. you know, how, how do they get in touch with you if they needed to reach out to you? Sure. It, uh, best way, you know, email or text. But uh, email is dave.wills, W-I-L-L-S, at bbsi.com. And uh, my phone number is 708-927-0085. But go through Butch. You know, we see each other uh, quite a bit and, and network well together. But I'm just excited that uh, I was on- excited and honored to be part of this podcast. So yeah, thanks, thanks. thanks as always. Yeah. I know we were talking about this for a while, but it's good to finally sit down. Yeah, thank you for coming. I appreciate it.